16 years here uh, at uh, the University of Toronto. And I live and work here in Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territories. So I just, I just wanna acknowledge my positionality here. Uh, and it, it's been a great honor to be here all this time and um, to work with the wonderful communities here and to raise my children here. My children have grown up in, in largely Anishinaabe culture. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that because it's brought a lot of healing, a lot of healing to my family. So miigwech. So a little overview. Um, we've, we, we've done our spiritual opening thanks to Roy. Um, we have two elders that work with us, but both of them uh, suddenly had last minute other things that they had to do today. So they weren't able to be here to, uh, to do our openings and closings, as well as to talk about some of the spiritual aspects of the workshop. Um, but we appreciate Roy stepping in and helping out with that today. Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about what is Indigenous data analysis and how it's different to, I guess, non-Indigenous data analysis. And then we're going to talk a bit more technically about methods and methodologies, the operational steps of what it means to do data analysis in Indigenous contexts, what some of those tools may look like, and how these interact with values, uh, medicines and ethics, and then kind of really hope to integrate that into what this really means for you and your work. So Indigenous data analysis is really about using Indigenous research methodologies as a framework for the data collection and analysis in the ethical protocols for the research project you're using and for dissemination and knowledge translation. So in other words, indigenous data analysis isn't something that's separate and on its own in, in indigenous research. It's actually intertwined with all the other research procedures, if you will, and it's based in indigenous knowledges as the framework. And and it's overlapping with the processes and all the others, as opposed to being objective and separate, which is sometimes how some Western research projects work. So to start off with, when we think, well, what is Indigenous data analysis? We have to sort of shift our way of thinking away from being data analysis is this one thing that's done over here as one part of the research. It's not necessarily like that when we're doing indigenous data analysis, it's something that is intertwined with all the other processes and steps of the research. And it's always going to be based in an indigenous research methodology. And I'm gonna explain a little bit more what that means in detail. Now, I'm sure many people here already know what this what indigenous methodologies are and you know sometimes we're a little hazy on what the difference is between methodologies and methods so methodologies are sort of like the overall framework that we use in research you know the 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 the, the conceptual uh principle the values the actual framework of the research what perspective are we coming from in the research and these are things that are are identified at the beginning of, of a research project. You know, what, what is the framework? Where are we coming from? So anytime we're gonna be doing indigenous research, meaning we're gonna be working with indigenous people or we're gonna be impacting indigenous individuals, communities or lands, we are gonna to need to use an indigenous methodology. And indigenous methodologies are things such as, now I just have a few examples of them here, the two-eyed seeing framework developed by Albert Marshall in 2012. Research as Ceremony by Sean Wilson, published in 2008. The seminal first written academic indigenous methodology for research as conceived by Linda Tway Smith. Uh, originally uh, in, oh my God, my brain is completely out to lunch, but I believe it was 1999 when the book first came out. It was just updated and reprinted in 2021. That's Decolonizing Methodologies. 
And then we have other indigenous knowledges frameworks, such as the seven grandfather teachings that are very localized, the Dene laws. So where I'm come from, we have what's called the laws of Yamoria, which are our values and ethics and our ways of, of, of understanding how to live and what our values and principles are. There's also Métis values. There's also Inuit knowledge frameworks for research. And there's many more. All localized areas and nations have their own Indigenous knowledges framework that is specific to their culture and their understanding. And those are all perfectly um, wonderful and acceptable uh, in research, Western research context to identify and use as our methodologies. So the research methods, now that's, that's a little different than the methodologies. The research methods are usually our very specific and prescriptive uh, in research interventions or things that we're doing with the research. And this is actually, you know, people ask, well, what research method is best to use with Indigenous research, with Indigenous partners, you know, when we're uh, looking at uh, something that's to do with Indigenous populations, uh, you know, which is the best way? And this is really a, a very simple question to answer. Um, yet, I, in my experience, it's often answered incorrectly by most researchers, even very experienced ones. And the correct answer is really that all methods are best in Indigenous research because they are dependent, like other rigorous research projects, on the research question. Right? We determine the method that's used based on what question we're trying to answer. So if we're asking a question about significance, then obviously we're going to want to use a quantitative method. method. If we're asking a question about the depth and detail of a particular phenomenon, we may want to take a qualitative method to answer that question. So it's not true that Indigenous health research, or it actually should say just Indigenous research in general, is only ethical or cultural if it's qualitative, or that it's not appropriate if it's quantitative or experimental. Because many Indigenous communities are looking for experimental research, quantitative research, uh, research that is not qualitative. And, and quite frankly, um, if, if an Indigenous community partner wants a question asked that requires a quantitative or experimental method, this is completely appropriate. What is not really appropriate is when ethical considerations are not addressed in any methodology or method used which can also be true for qualitative research. And you know, my uh, observation over 25 years of doing research is you know, that there is a general misconception in the scientific academic community that indigenous people are only qualitative and not quantitative thinkers. And that is why people often say that qualitative research is the only type of research that needs to be used when we're working with Indigenous people. And in my opinion, that is not only um, uh, not only um, demeaning and disrespectful, but it's actually downright racist. And, um, and there, there's, there's just there's just no, there, there's no way other than a colonial patriarchal racist mind that would say that qualitative research is the only appropriate research with Indigenous communities, people, or phenomenon, because Indigenous people are in fact very highly complex uh, thinkers over many centuries and would have had to be to really live on the land in a not only a, 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 a survival way, but in a sustainable way. Um, and, and that's what Western cultures all over the world are trying to do right now is understand how to live on the earth in a way that's sustainable. 
anyways, that's a different workshop, different conversation. So, um, so, so this is something that I can't underscore more. And this is something that you can explain to other people if they come to you and say, well, you know, qualitative research is the only kind to use with Indigenous people because it's ethical, uh, because Indigenous people think uh, they're oral, they think in narrative, they, you know, they, they think in, in pictures. I've heard every, every possible reason. And, and, you know, while I guess that may be true in some ways, if we're looking at individuals, um, in certain ways, but when we're talking about research and what people want to know and need to know in communities are asking to be researched, um, it's, it's, it's not really a, a very deep or holistic way to understand Indigenous research based on Western biases and colonial mindsets. So um, what are the operational steps of doing Indigenous data analysis? Well, Indigenous research, as we've talked about in many workshops leading up to this, and if you haven't seen them, they are on our website, uh, archived on our website, and you can, you can go straight to them uh, through that. And Roy's going to also put the Ontario NEAR website in our chat and that's where I think you can find some of these things or he'll tell you in the chat where you can see them. So some of the operational steps are that because we're coming from an Indigenous methodologies framework in our research, all, inherent to all Indigenous methodologies is being community driven or community based, meaning that we aren't doing research on, we're doing research with and in collaboration with Indigenous community partners at some level. Now, some people may find this to be tricky in certain ways, and it is tricky in certain ways, and it can be tricky. It can sometimes be awkward at the outset, but once we begin to make relationships with Indigenous communities as researchers, whether we're Indigenous or, um, or not, or from another community, like you know, for me, for example, when I came to Toronto, 16 years ago almost I was not from here I had no business doing research with people here um, without some sort of relationship building so it took me about two years of living and working in the community and doing things with the community before I felt ethically comfortable enough to um, ask community if they would be willing to work with me on any research projects. So when we've gone through that process and we have community partners and we have our data collected, because we've talked about that in other workshops, and we're ready to do the analysis, we have to remember to stay within Indigenous methodologies, which is all about community collaboration. And data analysis is, is one place where we're not going to drop off uh, collaborating with community in a meaningful way. And that means we're inviting our community partners, staff, uh, clients, stakeholders, whoever's involved in our community partner at the direction of the community partner leaders to be part of our research team. So that means we're training community partner members in data analysis along with our student research teams or whoever else is on our research team. And this means that we're also going to offer to pay the community member research, the community members who are part of the research team at the same rate we would pay graduate students to attend research meetings, to do the research work, whatever they're doing, they should be trained and compensated at the same level as the graduate students who are also being trained and doing the work. So I'm not sure if this is making sense or not. I feel like I've thrown a lot of information at people and, um, and, and I'm used to being interactive. So Zoom isn't really good for that, especially with the large crowd. Um, you know, the other parts of the operational steps are to ensure that elders and traditional knowledge keepers are actively involved in the research team data analysis process. So that doesn't mean that we just invite an elder to be part of a steering committee of the research or part of the research team and show up and do an opening and closing 
it means that we actually ask for their feedback and their input throughout the data analysis process. We actively engage with them. And in addition to that, it's important to meet frequently and in-depthly with the leadership of our community partner throughout the data analysis process in order to check in and get feedback with them on each step. So for example, we have a large data set of quantitative data from uh, um, a health data set from a community partner of, of hundreds of people's health data information and demographic information. So we have members of that uh, community partner on our research team, but we also meet with the leadership of the research team uh, of the community partner to uh, almost when we're in the process of data analysis, we meet with them almost weekly to say, okay, this is what we've done um, with these variables. This is the preliminary results of this. Does this make sense to you? Should we ask other questions? You know, those types of things. So we, we check in frequently because relationship is really based on uh, contact and meaningful engagement. So if we don't meet often with our community partner uh, people, then the relationship may not have the strength that it needs to, to ensure that the research process, such as the analysis, is actually uh, valid and rigorous. Because if we don't have the right amount of, of research input from the community partner, those results are not gonna be meaningful to the community. So we're not just doing this for the sake of doing this, we're doing this for a reason because we want the analysis to reflect the needs of the community. And we can't necessarily always correctly guess the needs of the community without them there actually telling us, oh, what about this? What about that? This looks good. Maybe don't do this. You know, that those are things that we as academic researchers, even if we may have cultural understandings or community need understandings there, may not necessarily think of. So the other reason it's important to meet often with our community partners in the analysis process is because we need to ensure ongoing informed consent. And that means that in Indigenous contexts, informed consent, as it's understood in the Western research context, is not a one-stop event. It's an ongoing process. We ask for consent to even get together and do this work. And then as we go at each step, is this okay? Should we do this? Are you still good with this? Should we do something different? You know, that, that's what informed consent means. And ongoing informed consent is just an aspect of that meaningful, uh, ethical relationship that we have with our community partners. So I'm going to stop now so we can go into breakout rooms because I feel like I've thrown a lot of information out at you so far. Um, so uh, just to, to further kind of break this down a little bit before we do, so when we, when we get our community partners into the research team, I don't like the word team. I don't really use that word. We don't use those words because team is a bit of a Western term that's also has a competitive edge to it. Um, in our research group, when we have our community partners there, we ask them, we treat them as experts, as community experts. We don't just bring them in and say, oh, we're gonna teach you guys how to do data analysis. We ask for their feedback. We ask for their support. We ask them, how can we modify um, the process of data analysis? Because of course, as academic researchers, we are required by the institution to have our data analysis process set out and laid out and, and, and determined at the very outset, you know, at our proposal, uh, at our ethics. And while we have definitely had community input as Indigenous community researchers at those levels, when we get down to the nitty gritty and on the ground and we have data here and we have our analysis tools here and we're all sitting together around the table, whether it's in person or virtual, and we're about to undertake analysis, 
we may want to check with our community partners. Does this look like a good way to do this? Should we change something? Should we alter something? Is there another way that we can do this that would work better for you? You know, that's a very important part of the of data analysis using indigenous framework is that we work together and we aren't just um, we aren't just telling the community that this is how we have to do it. We need to do it together and we need to let them lead. And then we need to lead when they ask us to. So, I mean, there are probably other things we could ask community, but what I'd like to do right now is move into breakout rooms of maybe three to four people. Uh, Joshua, if you're able to do that. And this would be a moment when in our small groups, okay? So, you know, I, I wanna share some of the data analysis tools that we use so that you understand that this isn't anything that's scary or overwhelming or different. So most of my qualitative research is uh, a narrative indigenous methodology uh, method that that I um, developed and adapted from uh, my dissertation work way back in 2007, and um, and I use an indigenous qualitative coding tool, which which I've developed uh, with community partners. Now, this I'm just used sharing this as an example. Everyone here who's done qualitative research has their own qualitative. Uh, data col uh, collection and analysis tools, which are perfectly fine to use. And, you know, those are used in uh, consultation and collaboration with your community partners, whoever they may be. Quantitatively right now, we're doing a lot of surveys and quantitative data collection. We use Qualtrics because of the, uh, the attention to ethics that it has, it's, it's uh, approved and used by our university. So it's got all of the uh, data um, protection pieces in place. And that's an important piece when we're talking about any data, but particularly indigenous data that we're able to maintain the confidentiality uh, and the, um, I can't think of the right words, but the security and safety of the data. So making sure that you use a quantitative platform that has all of the security uh, that is required in order to make sure that no one can hack in there and take it or use it in a way that it's not supposed to be used. So these are what we use. I'm just showing these to you as a sample and maybe you have your own. Um, the important piece about using these types of tools is using an indigenous knowledges framework for analysis. So meaning that when we're analyzing our qualitative or quantitative data, we're using indigenous knowledges as our framework, whatever that those indigenous knowledges specific frameworks are, that we're using those. We're not using a Western framework. Like, so I'm a psychologist. So for instance, I'm not using, you know, uh, DSM-4 criteria or DSM-5 criteria for looking at the mental health of Indigenous people, I'm using an Indigenous knowledges framework for doing that. Um, and that I'm including Indigenous community partner input and voices throughout the analysis process. And that I'm paying a lot of attention to ethics throughout the process. Um, that th Those are critical pieces. So when we talk, when I say using an indigenous knowledges framework. That means using a framework that's based in indigenous cultural values. And, you know, these are some of the key words that we come across in all of the indigenous knowledges frameworks that exist across. I've seen indigenous knowledges frameworks from all over the world. They're all different, but they all have the same values and themes, you know, that, 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 are, that are universal in indigenous knowledges, but how these are identified and practiced, of course, is different from community to community because our knowledges are based on the land and the environment. And so that's gonna make these different in terms of definition and practice in every community because the land is different in every community. 
medicine. Our medicines are important and critical parts to the data analysis process. And that's why we have our spiritual people involved to bring the medicines into the data analysis process. And that looks like however our spiritual people say it should look like. If we need to smudge at the beginning and end of our meetings, if we need to have opening and closing prayers. In one project in particular, the spiritual leader who was involved, who was actually a healer, said that we needed to actually smudge all the papers we were using in the data analysis process throughout that project. So that's what we did. We involved medicine. We offered tobacco. We, we had ceremony. We did pipe ceremonies. We did everything. And that's not up to me as a Western academic person to do. That's up to our spiritual people who are part of the project. And that's why we need them there, because we need to have our projects to be spirit led, spirit infused. And we have to have those people there to do that. And that's very important. That's what makes the research meaningful in part along with all the other things. So the ethical piece, you know, I, I've said that throughout this workshop and I, it's, it's, it's something that I'm sure people are sick of hearing me say, but ethical issues needs specific attention through data analysis. And I, I mentioned that informed consent is something that has to be ongoing. That's part of indigenous ethics is ongoing informed consent because the relationship is non-linear. It goes on and on and on. Reciprocity. So some acts of reciprocity in concrete terms are things like offering tobacco to people as we go through the process giving honorariums to community participants or community partners who are involved in working in the research, ensuring that the benefit of the research benefits the participants, benefits the community partners, benefits community. It's not just benefiting us as researchers so we can get our funding, get our papers written, do our thesis, do our dissertation, give people jobs, give ourselves a job. That's not why we're doing this. It's not just to benefit us, it's to benefit community and land and people. Reciprocity also includes doing things for community outside of the research process and project. All of our community partners, I'm constantly asking them, so what's going on down there you know, right now? What can we do to help? You know, do you need a, a grant? proposal written? Do you need community services delivered? Do you need people to work in your clinic? Whatever a community partner needs, I do my best to provide that because our uh, capacity goes way beyond research uh, in our research group. You know, we have psychologists on our research group. We have statisticians. We have frontline workers. We have counselors. We have public health workers. We have people who can pack food hampers and deliver them to community members. We have people who can work the front desk. We have people who can do anything that a community organization needs help with right now. And that's part of the reciprocity going beyond the research project to provide that community organization with what they need in the moment, in that week, that month, that year. And of course, working from a place that pays attention to respect. And respect isn't only, you know, be showing up at meetings on time and speaking nicely. It's really about using empathic listening and speaking skills at all times. And it also means in an Indigenous research context, using a trauma-informed, culturally safe framework as part of the conceptual um, creation, the conceptual framework of the research and behaviorally in your actions with participants and community partners throughout the project. And if anyone here doesn't know what a trauma-informed, culturally safe uh, modality is, you can Google that and you can take trauma-informed and cultural safety training programs online. They're offered everywhere in right now and for free. So, um, so it's very important to have those hard skills of being able to act from a trauma-informed cultural safe uh, lens and framework. Um, I can't underscore that enough. 
that's a whole workshop on itself and there are whole training modules. So, so please, um, please feel free to look into those. And we're gonna take a few moments for questions uh, at, at, in, in a minute. Yeah. We're just gonna kind of wrap up the presentation. So context is really important. In anything to do that's indigenous, context is everything. And it's critical in the conceptual framework of the study that the work be spiritually and culturally grounded. And I've, I've said this at bits and pieces throughout. And this really means that in practice, indigenous ethics and spiritual practice are embedded throughout that research design, including um, in, in the data analysis. So for example, you know, this, this looks like having a spiritual name for the project, you know, engaging with those spiritual uh, cultural people uh, actively. So a good example of this is the Ontario NEAR research project um, that I'm part of. And I think Roy put that in the chat, the link to the website. You can see what that looks like uh, in, in practice, who the collaborate, who the co-applicants are in the project, how the project is structured. You know, the proposal was written over a year with community partners. We worked for a year to create the proposal. Um, and, and we have a spiritual name. So Roy, if you're still here, you can, you can stick the Ontario near website um, uh, there. So I think maybe we can move to some questions or other discussion. Uh, we're not gonna do that. Hang on, let me get back here. So I think somewhat, there were a few questions that came up. You want me to stop or pause recording for the Q? Oh, yeah, yeah, pause the recording. Thank you. Okay. 